Welcome back to our uh, new meeting time. Uh, I do have one announcement for Wednesday. I will be pre-recording that lecture as I have a conflict on Wednesday. However, you probably won't even know that I'm not completely here, uh, that the lecture will be pre-recorded. I'll still be able to answer questions. So if you've got any questions, feel free to stop the lecture at any time. I'll just be, uh, in case I I uh, can't actually give the lecture live. I want to pre-record it, but I still plan on uh, being there for it and can stop and answer questions. And if that doesn't work, I've got two people as backup who will also uh, listen in for questions and answer things as well. So Wednesday's lecture will be pre-recorded, but we will have it at our new current time, uh, still 11.30 Iowa time, but 17.30 GMT time. Any questions before we begin? Okay. Well, I have a question. And my question is, who are the authors of this 1953 paper? If you know the answer from me, then wait before other people uh, respond. But if you know the answer on your own, not from me, I'd like you to type in who are the authors of this 1953 paper describing DNA. So noting that DNA is this you know, helical structure with two coaxial molecules. We've got a period of 34 angstroms. So every time we come around here, this will be about 34 angstroms. There's a repeating unit about, of about 10 nucleotides within that repeat of 34 angstroms. The phosphate groups, that's these gray things, the blue ones over here, these are the phosphate groups. Uh, you're supposed to be typing in an answer. I'm checking to see if you know basic biology. Who are the famous authors of this paper? Um, so I'm looking for more responses, so continue responding. So you've got the phosphate groups on the outside. And the sugar and bases, so A paired with T, well, this just says the sugar and bases, but that's what the sugar, the bases are A and T, C and G. Although in biology, not everything necessarily, uh, you know, always follows the rules. But we do have the bases on the inside and the phosphate groups on the outside. Okay, does anyone actually know the correct answer? I'm still actually waiting for the correct answer. Does anyone actually know the correct answer? No one knows the correct answer. So everybody is typing Watson and Crick. And people are wondering why I'm saying Watson and Crick are incorrect for the authors of this 1953 paper. I did not take these quotes from the 1953 paper of Watson and Crick. I took it from a different paper. And I guess I will have to say who, because no one seems to know. The paper I took it from was actually uh, Franklin and Goswin's paper. So this, all these quotes were from Franklin and Gosling. Yes, there was another very interesting paper published in exactly the same issue. So at the same time, published in the same issue was the paper by Watson and Crick, where they did propose this helical structure with the bases, and they proposed that A paired with T as well, and G paired with C. So. Uh, Watson and Crick also made similar observations in their modeling paper, but this was more modeling versus in uh, Rosalind Franklin's paper, this was based upon the crystal structure, so based purely upon uh, what she saw in the crystal structure, what she and R.G. Gosling saw in the crystal structure. You can actually tell because one of the differences between the two papers is because hers is, uh, um, oh, I still have pen, was from a crystal structure. She actually had actual measurements. So that was the hint that I wondered if somebody would pick up 
uh, Watson Crick would have not have known the exact measurement, uh, but Rosalind Franklin did. So of those, so if we take a look at you know these two papers, you all guessed this one. Uh, you probably know the history. They quoted in one of their later sources that Rosalind Franklin's crystal structure was vital to them actually determining. It, it played an important part for them realizing that it was double helical. They were thinking along, there were actually many people who were thinking uh, maybe a triplet structure or maybe a double helical. Did the things point outside or inside? There were a number of ideas out there at the time. Uh, and they certainly had excellent modeling skills, but they did use uh, Rosalind Franklin's uh, crystal structure of DNA uh, as part of this uh, outcome. They used it without her permission. In other words, what I'm doing today is an ethics lecture, so we're going to spend about 10 minutes on ethics. Uh, you will notice that if you collaborate with anyone, in particular biologists, how data is treated will depend upon your collaborators. In today's, uh, so we know that most people would have thought these quotes, that the double helical nature came from Watson and Crick. But in reality, the double helical stuff came from Rosalind and Franklin's crystal structure. The A paired with T and the G paired with C, that did come from Watson and Crick. It probably would have been obvious had what, you know, uh, Franklin published her paper first. I think a lot of people would have discovered this at the same time because people knew that they were in uh, rough proportion to each other. Uh, but many people today attribute not just the base pairing, but the double helix to Watson and Crick, when in reality that really comes from uh, the uh, crystal structure. The reason I mention this is, well, she still became famous, uh, probably would have gotten the Nobel Prize had she not died before, you know, it was awarded for the DNA structure. Uh, but um, uh, in today's grant funding stuff, your collaborators might be might want you to be very careful with their DNA. They're not good, not their they're kind of, they don't want you to mess up with their DNA either. But your collaborators are going to want you to be careful with their data. You know, you need to protect data unless your collaborators have said that you can give it out or that you can discuss your results for the data. That is a conversation that you need to have with your collaborators. In biology, if people get scooped, they might be losing several years worth of work. That means that their PhD student, their graduate student, does not get to graduate. So if they have results that get published just you know, a week before they're ready to submit, that means they've lost their PhD. They can no longer graduate. Uh, it also means that the biology collaborator might lose their grants, and that means they can't conduct any more experiments and get you additional data. So there's a reason why biologists are very much into protecting their results, protecting their data. You know, in mathematicians, we frequently will just give things out, you know, years before they're published. Uh, in biology, publication time can you can submit a paper and know two weeks later whether it's been accepted. You know, things move far differently in biology. So if you do work with uh, biologists or other people, make sure you're all on the same page. And that isn't just in terms of the data. Uh, you know, they should not have gotten her data without, you know, her permission. It's the same thing with you know, mathematicians today, they may not realize that they should not give out the data, uh, talk to the biologists. And it isn't just the data, you also need to protect the results as well. So in all of your modeling, talk to them first as to can you discuss your results right away or do you need to wait until after publication? Often they will let you discuss it, but they should know first off. 
And sometimes they'll say, no, we want to hold off on this result because otherwise we'll get scooped and we won't be able to publish, we'll lose our grants, etc. So make sure you communicate with your uh, collaborators as to what it is you're willing to release and then only release what you should. Any questions on that? Okay. So thanks for falling into my Watson Crypt trap uh, to illustrate the stuff about protecting data and results. Uh, biologists actually aren't always good about protecting data and results. And so I wanted to mention a few things about the genomic data and privacy. That is actually a big issue this year. Uh, this article was published in 2013. In March of 13, so in March of 2013, uh, some scientists published the complete genome sequence of cancer cells from a woman whose cells were taken back in 1951 without her permission. She had an extremely aggressive form of cancer. So her name is Henrietta Lacks, and the cells are HeLa. If you've done any collaboration with biologists, to the point of actually reading biology papers and knowing a little bit about the lab work, you've probably heard of HeLa cells because they're actually very common. Uh, HeLa cells are, came from the tumor cells of Henrietta Lacks. They're special. Most cells will only divide a, a finite number of times, but these will divide an infinite number of times, which is extremely useful to biology research. We would not be anywhere near, in terms of biology knowledge, if it had not been of HeLa cells. We wouldn't have the polio vaccine. There's a lot of things we would not have if it were not for the HeLa cells. But, and, and in terms of if I have my blood drawn and, you know, my blood then gets used by biologists in an experiment, as a scientist, I'm perfectly fine with that. In fact, I would not want people to be able to prevent the use of HeLa cells or other similar types of biological stuff because, you know, it saves lives. However, taking cells, taking blood and using it without letting the family, you know, she died so they couldn't really ask permission from her, but without letting the family know and not considering what might, you know, the results, how this could affect the family, you know, that's actually something that we need to think about these days and we need to think about uh, closely. So the HeLa cells, the publication of the genome, well, she has relatives that still exist today. Now, people can argue that because it was the genome of the actual cancer cells, which are highly mutated, you know, these cells were quite mutated, from the normal cells that then get passed on to the rest of her family. So the cancer cells did not get passed on to the rest of her family because they, uh, you know, survived. <laughs> but uh, her normal cells did, and they will have something in common with her cancer cells. In fact, if we take a look at a uh, paper, so actually I'm going to get ahead of myself, uh, in terms of a uh, general audience paper, um, uh, for Henrietta Lacks uh, in the Smithsonian Magazine uh, about her mortar cells. Sometime in the 1970s, they determined that there was contamination between, so there were a number of different cell lines. But HeLa cells are extremely strong. They could float on dust particles and on unwashed hands, and they, they contaminated other cultures. And this was a problem because when you work with a cell culture, you would like to know whether you're working with, you know, HeLa cells or whether you're working with a different cell culture. You know, the cell culture you work with can affect your results. And so you need to know whether or not your cell culture was contaminated. So 
one group of scientists tracked down uh, Henrietta Lacks's relatives, and they took some of her family's DNA so they could make a map of the genes so they could tell which subcultures were Gila and which were, were not, you know, which were not contaminated, so they could straighten out this contamination problem. So thus, there is, even though the Gila cells are, were the cancer cells, there was still a relationship to the family DNA. If we go back over the timeline, there was the biopsy in 1951 without consent or knowledge. In the 1970s, it became known that it was actually Henrietta Lacks, so it was known to the scientific community uh, and into mainstream uh, press. And uh, in 73, the family members learned, and their blood was, connect was collected, but again, without proper informed consent. Biology has some really bad history. This is not the worst of it but we now do need to do better with informed consent, and there are still issues today with informed consent, especially in third world countries where a lot of genetic mapping is being done. Um, so there's a number of papers that you can uh, you know, research about DNA privacy issues that will you know, bring up some of these issues. So uh, they were eventually honored, and this year they, oh, the thing was published without uh, their consent, but they did uh, actually come to an agreement in August of this year uh, that uh, the data can be released, but you actually have to apply for it. So not everybody can access the data. Uh, you do have to apply for it. This is actually both good and bad. The bad is now there's limited access. I might want to analyze this data and maybe my analysis would be absolutely fantastic and we'd learn so much from, you know, my personal analysis of this data and maybe, I don't know, I haven't tried to get access, I don't have a legitimate reason at the moment, but you do have to, you know, it, it would be an extra step. So I wouldn't just, uh, analyze this data on a whim and discover, you know, some good stuff. But the good is in terms of privacy, there are actually serious privacy issues with having the, your DNA on the web, and especially if your DNA is, you know, identified easily on the web. Okay, you can say this was cancer cells from Henrietta Lacks. But notice they did, they do relate to the family's DNA. You know, your DNA does relate. So if any member of your family has your DNA posted on the web, like on a genealogy site, well, they share some of your DNA, so some of your DNA is also available on that website. So having things posted, you know, there are actually serious issues to this. I have thought about having my DNA sequenced because, you know, as a scientist, I'd love to know, you know, more about my DNA and, I, you know, having it out there so that scientists and others, uh, these scientists are sometimes at private companies, sometimes they're at, you know, at public companies, uh, but having it out there so it can be analyzed, I have no problem contributing to that. But if I did, there are issues with that. So this is from NPR. There are other sources as well. In the USA, a law called GINA was passed in 2009 that made it mostly illegal for an employer to fire someone. But in the past, employers have actually fired someone based upon genetic testing. If you know that your employee is likely to get Alzheimer's and cost your insurance lots and lots of money, well, getting rid of them would be a good idea. Same thing for health insurance. If you find out that, you know, this person is likely to get Alzheimer's, 
Are you going to want to give them health insurance that will cost you, again, lots and lots of money? Probably not. And that's why in 2009 that uh, there was this law that made it illegal to fire someone and health insurance, you know, cannot raise your rate. So just because you have the Alzheimer's gene does not mean your rates can be raised. But in the past, simply having your DNA sequenced, even if you were the control in some scientific study, if you just were, you know, participating in a scientific study as a control, your health insurance could, you know, raise your rate or deny you coverage. Now they can't, and it's mostly illegal. There's always exceptions. If you work in a company with fewer than 15 employees, they can still fire you. So there are still exceptions. So in other words, I can have my DNA sequenced. Maybe I'll post it on a genealogy website, or maybe I'll go through the 3DNA, and maybe some other company might eventually get a hold of that data, and my nephew could be fired. Or my nephew might not be able to get life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. So the GINA only applies to health insurance. Um, and who knows what's true. If I move to another country, I may not have the same protections, or I might have more protections. And this actually is a sticky issue. We could public, you know, maybe we could, you know, get Congress to pass another law. We know they're so good at that. Um, to include life insurance, disability insurance, and long-term care insurance. Well, if we did that, all these insurance rates would go up for everybody, because after all, if I find out that I have the Alzheimer's gene, I'm fortunate to have no family history of that, but if I found I had the gene, what would I do? I would go out and buy life insurance, disability insurance, and long-term care insurance, especially long-term care insurance. And if I found out I didn't have the gene, well, I might not ever get around to buying long-term care insurance. And so you would really bias the pool, especially for long-term care insurance. That's not that common yet in the U.S. for people to have. And basically what long-term care insurance means is that if you get really sick and need to spend some time in the nursing home or you need home health care for several years, health insurance doesn't cover that. So... You might want long-term care insurance if you expect to have Alzheimer's, and you might not be able to get that if you or someone in your family has had their DNA sequenced. So there are some pretty, you know, important results that could occur from uh, having DNA sequenced from either you or a relative. One fun application is... Suppose that your dad was an anonymous sperm donor. Well, you can find your dad through the internet, even if he was almost completely anonymous. So how did this teenager do this? Well, there's basically a number of online DNA test genealogy DNA testing services. So he took his saliva, sent it to one of them, and... Well, the father was not on the site. He had never supplied his DNA. So, again, the point is you don't have to supply your own DNA. All you need is relatives to have supplied their DNA. And he found two matches. The two matches were two people who did not know each other, but they had similar surnames. There was a different spelling. But he now has basically the surname, maybe not the exact spelling, but... This is now a key thing that he now knows is an approximate spelling of the surname. And based upon the genetic similarity, they likely have a father, grandfather, or great-grandfather in common. So now he can just look for the surname. He did have two additional pieces of information, and that was the uh, where his father was born, as well as when his father was born. So he knew his father's birth date and his place of birth. So now he could buy that information, and so he bought that information and did find his father. 
often when DNA is collected, additional information besides the DNA sequence is included. And just by combining three pieces of information, the DNA sequence, which gave him an approximate surname, along with the place and date of his birth, he could then figure out who his father was, contacted him, and in this case there was a happy ending. But if you want to remain anonymous, there's no chance you can remain anonymous these days, or it's a slim chance you can remain anonymous. Um, so let's get back to the science of these sorts of things. You know, we can't really control the, uh, the um, genealogy websites, but there are a number of consortiums for scientific study. So there's a number of people who have donated their DNA anonymously. And they only start off with trying to match 10 individuals. And they were able to get the identity of 50 individuals using something very similar to what this teenager did. They had the DNA, so they went on the genealogy website. They did have some additional information of uh, the city where the DNA was donated uh, and the age of the participant. So they were also able to use uh, so they use the genealogy database in order to determine the surname, and then using the age as well as the location where the DNA was donated. Donated. They were able to track down the original 10, and then they could expand it to 40 additional family members. And so they were able to track down a lot of people uh, by just trying to look at 10 people originally. So whenever you uh, are at a store giving information or your bank or your credit card is saying, oh, it's okay because we anonymized your data. This has been done not just for DNA. This has been done for cell phone data, for all sorts of type of data. So all this data out there where you are supposedly anonymous, you know, it's been anonymized, your name and all sorts of identifying information has been supposedly removed. Well, chances are not enough has been removed. People will still be able to go back and figure out who you are. So data is not really anonymous. The uh, age has now been removed from this data stuff. Uh, they're trying to do things to make things more anonymous. There are, is a lot of work to make it more anonymous. I still recommend donating your DNA to science. I still think it's a great thing. But there are consequences for both you and your relatives. So that is something to keep uh, in mind. And they are doing a much better job of trying to make your DNA more anonymous by having fewer extra pieces of information on there. Any questions about that? OK, so that is basic our ethics study. Make sure you protect your DNA, not your DNA. Don't protect your DNA. Give it to science. I, I think that's a good thing to do. But protect the data. If it's not your own personal data, you should protect your data, both for your, the sake of your collaborators but also for the sake of the people for whom you got your data. Now, if it's mouse data or yeast data, then you don't have to worry as much about protecting it, except you still need to worry about protecting it for your collaborator's data. You don't want to be the subject of another uh, Franklin versus Watson and Crick story. So you should still protect the data for your collaborator. Say, discuss how much you want to release. Eventually, it should be released, you know, if, especially if it's not human da data, you know, eventually it should be released. In fact, NIH grants generally require that the data be released at publication. And so a lot of data is available because eventually you definitely do want to release it. That is actually another part of ethics as well, is that you don't want to be hiding everything you want other people to analyze your results, and without the data, they can't do a firm analysis. 
and you want other people to do other types of analysis. So part of ethics is eventually it does need to be released as well, but decide what your collaborators when would be a good time. So any questions about any of this? Okay. So now we're going to go back to the math. We had one last basic thing to cover, and that's stability. And that will relate to uh, an application with microarray data, uh, freely available mouse microarray data. Uh, it'll be related to that uh, uh, semi-indirectly, but we'll also talk about stability there. So it's definitely related to, to this as well. So let's finish up uh, the last basic thing that we should really uh, discuss. So suppose we have this nice data. So let's take a look at the pink curve first. So this is our data, and it actually goes on down here. And uh, so this maps something. Maybe it's the concentration of RNA at different time points. That's actually what we will look at later is concentration of RNA at different time points. And then we mat, might map this to R via you know, this Morse function and then do a sublevel set. And so by the sublevel sets, we'll basically say, well, let's cut off at this thing. Let me change colors here. So uh, color. if I can get it. We might be. OK. So suppose I take a look at the part that's just below. That's supposed to be a straight line. Pretend it's a straight line that's completely horizontal. Everything below this is what we will be interested in. And we're going to be interested in the number of components. We're going to be interested in the zero homology uh, for this particular example. So right now we have two components. One component started a bit earlier. So we'll have this component starting down here. And it still exists at this time. And then this component starts about here. And it still exists at this time. And we continue increasing. So now instead of our epsilon balls, we're doing the height function. So we talked about doing these sort of things with these Morse functions, but any sort of thing where we map from here into other stuff, and then we take pre-images. So we took the pre-image of this thing and looked at the number of components that we had back here. The next interesting pre-image is one that contains our next local minimum. So if I take a line slightly above that, we can see at this stage, a third component will start. And so at this time, we will have a third component stuck start, and that component will persist for a while. The next interesting time point will be, so if this is my time increasing time, the next interesting time point will be when I'm at a maximum, because at a maximum, then these two get joined together. So this component here, let me actually uh, see if I can change my color again. So we had uh, these two components. So up to here, we had these two components. So these two components right here. I didn't really so much in terms of a different color. But oh well, they then get joined up to um, they get joined up here once we go through the maximum. In other words, at this time, we will go ahead and end the youngest component. So our youngest component starts at this time and ends at this time. So it starts at a local min, ends at a local max. And similarly, this one right here, once we go up here, if we now add all of these points, if we look at this time component, this component starts at this local min, will now get joined. So we'll now get the entire graph at this time here. So it will end here. And then this component will continue on forever. And we've got our barcode. Any questions about that? 
Well, from our barcode, we can take a look at our persistent diagram. And remember, in our persistent diagram, we just plot our birth times and our death times. So this was, uh, oops, I ended the wrong one. This one was the youngest one, so this was the one I was supposed to end. This is the one that went on, so let me write over that in a darker color. So this was the youngest one, so that one should have ended. This was the oldest one, so this one persists. So this component persists. This one gets mapped to that one, so it starts here and ends there. Okay. So then in terms of our barcode, we can just plot the, the birth time to the death time. So we've got, you know, young birth, old death, medium birth, medium death, and that gives us our persistent diagram. Any questions up to there? Okay. So we've got our persistent diagram over here. Uh, for our red curve, it's really just these two points corresponding to uh, this point right here, having this min canceling out with that max, and this point right here, this min canceling out with that max. But in reality, how often is your data this smooth? Your data usually isn't this smooth. Your data usually has lots and lots of noise in it. And if it's got, you know, noise in it, it's going to be, you know, jumping all over the place. And so in reality, what we really probably have is the blue curve and not the red curve. And with the blue curve, you can see that there's a number of things that, you know, get born at this minimum, but then get canceled at this maximum. So you're going to have a number of points that are close to the diagonal that are born, but then die very soon. So we take a look at, you know, maybe this point gets mapped, matched to this one, so it might be born here but then it'll join with this one at this time point, and so it doesn't last long. And so you have a number of points that are very close to the diagonal. And the question is, suppose you have two different persistent diagrams. So we've got our blue persistent diagram and our red persistent diagram, you know, the red one here with just the two points. And maybe you want to compare two different experiments. And so you might have a green persistent diagram talking about another collection of experiments. Well, what you would like to do is know how close your two persistent diagrams are. So one type of distance is the bottleneck distance between persistent diagrams. And so one definition of given two different diagrams, so in this case we're given a blue diagram and a red diagram, and we want to calculate the distance between these two diagrams. Well, what we can do is talk about the L infinity distance, which is just the maximum between the coordinates. In our case, n equals to 2. And so I just have x1, x2, y1, y2. So I take the maximum between the first coordinates and the maximum between the second coordinates. So if I'm interested in these two points right here, the distance, if the maximum is in the second coordinate, so that would be the distance. For these two points right here, the distance would be in terms of the uh, second coordinate. Uh, sorry, the first coordinate. Let me go ahead and erase all my ink on my cluttered slide and start again. So here, if I take a look at these two data points, the distance between these two data points using the L infinity would be the distance using the second coordinates. So we'd be looking at this distance. For these two data points, the maximum 
between the distance between the first coordinates and the second coordinates, well, the first coordinate distance is much bigger than the second coordinate distance, and so we'd be taking that for our distance between these two points. So now we have a distance between these two points and these two points, but this blue curve has a lot more points, so we need to determine a distance there. Well, since those are coming from noise, what we can talk about is the distance between the point being born and died at the same time. And so we add the diagonal. So we'll add the diagonal. And that's where the, you know, uh, our, you know, things, you know, the birth time equals to the death time. Okay, we might not actually have a component, so this is, you know, uh, you know, just a convenience. So this is really just a convenience in order to be able to say, well, this thing, you know, was born relatively soon, but it died soon. If we were to perturb this a little bit, we'd be perturbing this thing which, you know, existed and died someplace along the diagonal, supposedly. At any rate, however you motivate it, we're talking about the distance now to the diagonal. So we take the closest distance to the diagonal, and so we throw in the diagonal, so our x and our y are actually all our points in our persistent diagram along with our diagonal. So we've got our points in our persistent diagram union the diagonal. And then we map them to the closest points. So here, this red point is closest to this blue point. This blue point is closest to this red point. This blue point is closest to this red point along the diagonal. And so we can now uh, come up with a bijection between the red and the blue points. In this particular case, this red and blue point is mapped to itself. So any point along the diagonal will be mapped to itself unless there is a point off the diagonal that is close to it and gets knocked there instead. So given this collection of points in our persistent diagram union the diagonal, we'll come up with a bijection between the two. We can do the bijection because even if there are more blue points than red points, the diagonal contains an infinite number of points, so we can always map any leftover points to the diagonal questions up through here. Then what we do is we take the L infinity distance for each point. So we take the L infinity distance for each point. These are the diagonal. So either the vertical or the horizontal distance will do. Either the vertical or the horizontal distance will do. Maybe I will get a different pen color. So, so you can take either the vertical or the horizontal the vertical or the horizontal distance, vertical or horizontal distance, either the first coordinate or the second coordinate distance. And then, so we calculate all of these for every single point. So for every single point, so this is, these are points, these are points, you know, for every single point, we calculate the distance between x and g of x. And then we take the soup over all those. So the maximum one of these, maybe that would be this one here, maybe that would be the largest one. So then we take the maximum of that. And then we take the infimum over all bijections. So over all bijections between your points in your X persistent diagram, your blue persistent diagram, map to your red persistent diagrams. So then you take all the bijections and take the infimum, and the infimum is shown here. You know, I could have taken the bijection that instead had sent this blue point over here to this red point if I had wanted to, uh, but that would have given me a larger distance. So we take the infimum of all these, and that is the bottleneck distance. So that's one way of determining how close two persistent diagrams are, whether you're comparing 
one diagram where you've removed the noise to the other one where it came from rather noisy data or whether we throw in something else, you know, comparing two different data sets and want to see if they have similar persistent diagrams, we can calculate this bottleneck distance. There is a question as to how stable this is. And basically, suppose you have two functions from x into r. So, you know, my two functions, one of them, you know, was this and the other one was something that was that. However, it was your two functions. And so now, in terms of when we uh, take a look at this, uh, my two functions, this is not the function I'm talking about. I'm talking about two functions. Uh, unfortunately, the same letters are used, f and g. So maybe f is the blue function and g is the red function. Not this bijection. I should have used a different letter there. Sorry about that. Um, I might change that in the notes before posting. I should have used a different letter here because that is not the same as this function right here. But suppose we have two functions uh, from, you know, our x into r, where we're just doing this height function, so the same sort of thing here, this x into this real line thing here. Suppose you've got these two functions. Then if I take a look at the bottleneck distance, well, suppose my two functions are pretty close. So if I take a look at where these two points map to, maybe at so maybe if I take a look at uh, this point here, you know, at this value here, maybe f of x gets mapped here and g of x gets mapped over there. If f and g are pretty close to each other, so if these functions are pretty close to each other, then their bottleneck distance will also be close to each other. So we have the stability theorem saying that if we compare, if f of x and g of x are pretty close to each other, so that the maximum distance between these two things are pretty small, well then your bottleneck distance will be no larger than that. So that's a pretty nice stability theorem saying that persistence really does give us what we want. If we had had two things where we take our thing and then we perturb the data and we get very different persistent diagrams that are so different that their bottleneck distances are far apart, that would have been very bad. We would like this bottleneck distance. So if I go up here, the persistent diagram, so and I'll erase all the ink on the side. The persistent diagrams are pretty different. I've got these two points are close and these two points are close, but I've got all these other points over here. But by doing this bottleneck distance, by mapping it to the diagonal and looking at this distance here, we can see that these persistent diagrams really aren't that different. All of these points that are close to the diagonal well, we should really just ignore them because they just came from noise. And so this bottleneck distance, you know, really helps us by, you know, mapping some points to the diagonal that are close, other points to each other will tell us whether the diagrams are close. And by our stability theorem, if the functions are close, then the bottleneck distance will be close. The, the, the persistent diagrams will be close to each other. Any questions on that? One can also take a look at other types of distances. Instead of taking the soup here, you can instead do the sum and take a look at the Wasserstein distance. But when you do that, there is still a stability theorem, but you have to have that it's triangulable with a triangular stroke polynomial with exponent j, where that's the dimension. It has to be Tame and Lipschitz. So there's more hypotheses, but you still get this upper bound that if f and g are close, then their Wasserstein distance will also be close. So there is this other one. It is nice in that if we compare it, instead of doing the soup, so in this case we're doing the soup here. And, you know, you're looking at just the largest distance. All these smaller distances 
we don't care about. We look at just the largest distance. So only if this is the largest distance, we'll only take a look at this point. Over here, we take a look at many points. Uh, you know, all of them play a role. So you know, all of these distances would play a role in terms of the Wasser sine distance. But if we compare the persistent diagrams, the hypothesis here is weaker than the hypothesis. So if we compare the stability theorems, we compare the stability theorems, the hypothesis, it, we need more to go ahead and work with the Wasser sine distance instead. But that's the last basic thing. We will talk more about stability. It won't be quite the same thing, but we will talk about this paper uh, on Wednesday, which is uh, a, a night an interesting way of taking a look at time series in microarray data. So frequently you've got genes behaving in a particular pattern, sometimes periodic, and we will take a look at that using this paper as well as section 9.1 in this book. Any questions? Okay. So uh, see you Wednesday. <laughs>